One day in late 1914, what was intended as an important Antarctic expedition started to go badly wrong. On this day began a two-year nightmare of hardship, catastrophe, and ultimately, heroism of the highest order. Ernest Shackleton, a brilliant and charismatic leader, took 27 men on a voyage that would challenge their spirit and their lives. This is the saga of one of the most remarkable survival stories of the century, the voyage of the endurance. On this early December day in 1914, the ship Endurance is sailing easily through loose pack ice north of Antarctica. The expedition leader, Sir Ernest Shackleton, is an ambitious 40-year-old Anglo-Irishman. He is known for his way of drawing men to him and for his ability to get out of tight situations. The British expedition plans to sail through the Weddell Sea to the Antarctic. Their goal is to be the first to achieve an overland crossing of the continent. Ernest Shackleton was already a famed explorer. He was a rival of Sir Robert Scott's in the race to reach the South Pole. My father's relationships with Scott, it's rather difficult to describe it. You see, in a sense, my father was the adventurer who came in, who'd been Scott's, one of Scott's people, and decided to run his own expedition. In 1907, Shackleton led his own team on a failed attempt to reach the Pole. With him was Frank Wilde, who would later join Shackleton on the Endurance. In 1912, Scott beat Shackleton to the Pole, though Roald Admanson had reached it first. Competitive and driven, Shackleton turned his sights instead to the journey over the largely unknown Antarctic. The impression I've got from all I've read about Shackleton and his expeditions is that things were rather thrown together at the last minute, usually short of cash, and the thing was just driven by his amazing energy and enthusiasm and ambition, and things did go wrong. And compared to, say, the Norwegian polar expeditions, Shackleton's were possibly a bit shambolic, but he got himself out of those situations. Life on the Endurance is a mix of disciplined routine and good times. More than 50 dogs are to act as sled teams for the Overland Crossing. Frank Wilde is aboard as captain. Shackleton has an unshakable faith in his second in command. He was very dependent on Frank Wilde. I would say Wilde was a great man in his way. Frank Wilde and he, I don't think, had to finish sentences ever. A glance between them would have suggested what was necessary. That fateful summer, there are freak cold temperatures in the Antarctic. The ship's log notes the worsening weather and lack of progress. The Endurance gingerly picks her way through a minefield of heavy flows and bergs. By January 20th, 1915, the Endurance is trapped. Diary of Ship's Carpenter, Chippy McNeish, January 24th. Still fast and no sign of any opening. The pressure is a serious business and if we don't get out of it soon, I would not give much chance of ever getting away from here. The situation looks grim, yet the men have an abiding faith in the one they call the boss. For scientific leadership, give me Scott. For swift and efficient travel, Amundsen. But when you're in a hopeless situation, when there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. After more than a month in the pack, Shackleton decides to try to move the 300-ton endurance manually into open water. For close to two days, the crew works with virtually no rest, exhausting themselves battling against the ice.
When they are at the point of dropping, Shackleton has his crew push the ship backwards as far as she will go. He intends to ram his way through ice that was up to 18 feet thick. While he stands alone on the deck, the ship valiantly plows to within 400 yards of open water, but can go no farther. On February 24th, 1915, Shackleton gives up trying to free the ship, and the Endurance becomes a winter station. She will drift with the vagaries of the pack ice, which will take her anywhere it wanders. For the most part, the crew accepts it all with good cheer. They still hope that they can eventually complete their mission. The men keep up spirits with games of soccer on the tightly frozen pack, waiting for the ice to open. On board, Shackleton adheres to his deep belief in the importance of strict routine. There's some grumbling about chores, but the boss's authority is rarely questioned. The ship's hold becomes known as the Ritz, and life continues in relative comfort. Costumed reviews are very popular. Shackleton wins the award for worst singer, though there are several close contenders. The real enemy is the tedium, dealt with by ever more drastic measures. We all had our hair cut and then we had our photograph taken in the Ritz. We do look like a lot of convicts and we're not much short of that life at present, but still hoping to get to civilization someday. The latest litter of pups is also a diversion even for gruff old sailors like Tom Crean. Frank Wilde is fond of Samson, the biggest of the animals. The irrepressible dogs become more and more like pets to many of the men. The complacency is shattered one evening in early April. Millions of tons of ice are being shoved up against the endurance. Shackleton recalled that ominous night. During the night of the third, we heard ice grinding to the eastward, and in the morning we saw that the young ice was rafted eight to ten feet high in places. This was the first moment of the danger that was so greatly to threaten us in later months. I gave orders that accumulations of snow, ice and rubbish alongside the endurance should be shoveled away. The enormous efforts to relieve the pressure on the ship are hopeless. Even with her three-foot-thick hull, the Endurance is at the mercy of far greater powers than she could ever hope to overcome. July 14th, 1915. All hands standing by. We had a slight shock last night. There was a noise under the bottom aft, the same as if the ice had broken up. The boss thinks it was a whale, but I think it's different. Shackleton orders a special watch. It is a stressful and exhausting night, and in the morning, the pressure looks even worse. The assaults by the ice continue for weeks. The wind howled in the rigging, and I couldn't help thinking it was making just the sort of sound you would expect a human being to utter if they were in fear of being murdered. Shackleton said at length, you'd better make up your mind that it is only a matter of time. What the ice gets, the ice keeps. The unrelenting pressure damages the rudder of the ship beyond repair. Wilde and Shackleton are stranded. Trapped for more than seven months in the pack ice, they are now 1,200 miles from civilization. The crew has no communications and no hope of outside help. They have only Ernest Shackleton. October 18, 1915. The Endurance has been trapped for nine months. A wave of pressure causes the ship to keel over 30 degrees in a matter of seconds. Bent and twisted, she begins to leak dangerously. 
all hands work ceaselessly throughout an interminable night, pumping and repairing the damage. Even blankets are used to try to contain the leak. At 5 p.m. on October 27th, Shackleton gives the order to abandon ship. The attack of the ice reached a climax at four o'clock. After long months of ceaseless anxiety, after times when hope beat high and times when the outlook was black indeed, the end of the endurance has come. To his men, Shackleton says simply, ship and stores are gone, so now we'll go home. But in his own diary, he writes, I pray God I can manage to get the whole party to civilization. The boss is facing the most crucial test of his life. Shackleton tells his crew that they will head for the nearest supply depot, left behind years earlier on Paulet Island, 346 miles away. Within a few days, the Endurance loses her final struggle. attempt to march, but the terrain is impassable. Everywhere they turn, the ice blocks their way. I would have thought if anybody had had to take a bet on it, they'd have said, I would have said they were probably 10, 20 to 1 against bringing them back alive. I mean, after all, there they were, sitting in the middle of the, the Weddell Sea, in the middle of the pack ice, miles from land. It's very difficult to uh, contemplate what the likelihood of their getting back uh, alive were. I would almost have said they were negligible. For the next six months, the crew camps on unpredictable and hazardous ice flows. At the beginning, morale stays high. Shackleton's hopes are pinned on three small boats in which he plans to set sail when the pack opens. But if the Weddell Sea had crushed the Endurance, what could it do to these fragile craft? In the meantime, they drift helplessly with the pack. They were moving. They were on a mo moving ice flow, of course. And I su suppose Shackleton would have been very, very... Um, concerned with keeping it from the men, how desperate their situation was. In time, the supplies become depleted. The men hunt whatever game they can find, but food becomes an obsession. February 1916. The food is pretty well all meat. Seal steaks, stewed seal, penguin steaks, stewed penguin, penguin liver, the latter being very good indeed. The cocoa has been finished for some time, and the tea is very nearly done. Even the mild-tempered ship's doctor, James Macklin, is showing the strain. At such times, he wrote his diary in code. I think the boss was a bit improvident not getting all the food in whilst the going was good. It was worth the risk. As the months pass, game becomes scarce. Lunch is one biscuit, and three lumps of sugar are issued each day. On March 30th, Shackleton orders the men to shoot the surviving dogs. Now, they can eat. They come tantalizingly close to Paulet Island, but in the end, they drift helplessly past it and its vital supply depot. They have been marooned for 14 months, 
yet Shackleton somehow manages to keep his men from sinking into what could become fatal despair. People tell me that 50 times a day, people said, what do we do now, boss? OK, boss? He was known as the boss. And I think they literally had a pattern of activity that he controlled. And when they got to the end of a task, they turned to him, what do we do now, boss? The boss has to plan a new course of action after their near miss with Paulet Island. He will aim for Elephant Island instead, 100 miles to the north. The next decision on the morning of April 9th is made for him. At 11 a.m., our flow suddenly split right across under the boats. We rushed our gear onto the larger of the two pieces. Our home was being shattered under our feet. They take to the boats and in a roaring sea begin a dash for Elephant Island. For the next seven days, they fight a heroic battle. The storms are enormous. They go days without sleep. Thirst becomes overwhelming and their mouths and tongues are so swollen they cannot swallow food leading them through 17 hours of darkness each day is Frank Worsley, Shackleton's brilliant navigator. The temperature was 20 degrees below freezing point. Greenstreet's right foot had got badly frostbitten, but Lee's restored it by holding it in his sweater against his stomach. My eyes began to fail me. I could not see or judge distance properly and found myself falling asleep at the tiller. Yet Worsley's uncanny navigation brings the three battered craft to the bleak shores of Elephant Island. The men have not touched solid ground in more than 16 months. For the first time in three days, they have a meal and a hot drink. Uninhabited Elephant Island is a desolate and dangerous place. They have one forlorn hope the whaling station on South Georgia Island, 800 miles to the northeast. Shackleton decides to attempt the almost suicidal journey. The night before he leaves, he writes a note to Frank Wilde. April the 23rd, 1916, Elephant Island. Dear sir, in the event of my not surviving the boat journey to South Georgia, you will do your best for the rescue of the party. You are in full command from the time the boat leaves this island. You can convey my love to my people and say I tried my best. Yours sincerely, E.H. Shackleton. The next morning, the 22 men who will be left behind gather on shore. The optimists expect the boss back in a few weeks. Shackleton and five other men face the world's most vicious sea in a 23-foot open boat. Elephant Island, April 24th, 1916. We watched them until they were out of sight, which was not long, for such a tiny boat was soon lost to sight on the great heaving ocean. As she dipped into the trough of each wave, she disappeared completely, sail and all. Three days out, their craft is hit by a powerful gale. Enormous waves, 50 or more feet high, batter them relentlessly as they struggle in a last desperate effort to reach help. And these men were in this tiny 23-foot boat for 16 days altogether, uh, being tossed around uh, with these wet, reindeer clothes and reindeer sleeping bags chafing them and great wet rocks of ballast bumping against them uh, in huge waves. I mean, they were, they were in storm conditions, gale conditions, virtually for the entire time of the crossing. And I think Worsley only had one chance to take a sighting from the sun to work out their position and the rest was done entirely on dead reckoning. On May 8th, against all odds, the men sight the South Georgia coast. They spend nearly two days trying to make a landing on the island's treacherous shores. And it is the, the most wild coast with huge glaciers flowing down into the sea. And I think it was just as they finally managed to get through some rocks into this tiny little bay and drag the boat ashore 
uh, stumbling and slithering on, on the wet rocks and seaweed, that the, the main pin holding the rudder fell out <laughs> just at that moment as they, as they landed. Uh, incredible fortune that it had lasted till then. Fate compels them to land on the side of the island opposite the whaling station, which lies over an interior of glaciers and mountains that no human being has ever crossed. Terribly weakened, Shackleton is called on to lead yet another heroic effort. He has a bit of rope, a carpenter's adze, and some screws which the men twist into the bottom of their shoes. Leaving behind the three men who are too ill to make the trip, Shackleton sets off with Frank Worsley and Tom Crean. Shackleton was a polar expert, he was a seaman, but he wasn't really a mountaineer. And yet, when they arrived on the wrong side of South Georgia and had to cross it, uh, they were having to do a very serious bit of mountaineering. And I think that's where this incredible intuition came in. They knew roughly where they were going, but but they had no maps. At one point, Shackleton finds himself at the top of an impossibly steep slope. Once again, he decides to take an enormous gamble. But by this time, night was falling and the mist was covering the bottom of the slope. They had no idea what was uh, uh, at the bottom. They tried a few steps down, but it was evident that if they continued, they would die of exposure. So they coiled their rope down, the three of them sat on it, and they put their arms around each other's waists and they pushed off into space. They careen crazily down a thousand foot mountainside. At the bottom, they are bruised and torn, but to have survived at all is another in a long line of miracles. At about four o'clock in the afternoon of May 20th, 1916, three filthy, stringy-haired men dressed in tatters walk into a whaling station on South Georgia Island. Shackleton has to introduce himself to a man he has known for years. Don't you know me, he asks. The whaler hesitates. I know your voice. And the response comes, my name is Shackleton. Some say the old sailor turned away and wept. Less than three days later, Ernest Shackleton leaves South Georgia to return for his men on Elephant Island. It takes him more than three months and four different attempts. On August 30th, 1916, he finally sights the dismal coast. A signal fire can be seen burning faintly. Shackleton, though, has no way of knowing how many of his men are still alive. Yet on the beach is gathering the entire Elephant Island crew. All 22 men have survived. On shore, the realization slowly sinks in that the boat is really there, that the unendurable has been endured. Ernest Shackleton, the boss, has come to take them home. 